Welcome. In the last lecture on George MacDonald and Kierkegaard on the self, I talked about what I believe is MacDonald and Kierkegaard's common or similar understanding of the problem of human selfhood and its possible cure. And in particular, let's remember Kierkegaard's formula for freedom from despair. In relating to itself and in wanting to be itself, the self is grounded transparently in the power that established it. And both Kierkegaard and MacDonald talk about this grounding. While I believe that MacDonald's language about self was not completely consistent, that sometimes he fell into the common Christian terminology of trying to kill the lower self and put on the Christ self, I do believe that by the end of MacDonald's life, he had come to a deeply and fully worked out understanding of the healing of our selfhood and he expresses that beautifully in his great imaginative work Lilith written at the end of his life. In this lecture I would like to examine more closely the grounding motion. I believe that both MacDonald and Kierkegaard are saying at their best that what we need is not a dead self, an annihilated or obliterated or replaced self, but a grounded self. And I would like to examine in more depth that motion by which the self grounds itself in its source and creator. We could call that grounding motion the leap of faith in a very real way. And that leap of faith is a well-known idea or theme from Kierkegaard, but it's important for us to have an accurate understanding of it. The leap of faith is certainly not a blind leap, a denial of reason, um, a subscription to the idea that there is an inherent conflict between faith and reason, Rather, it is a leap of utter personal trust. In MacDonald, it is a leap, unreserved leap of naked trust into the Father's arms, of bringing our being back to the source, saying, here, O oh Father, is this being, the self that you have created. I give it back to you. It's yours. You know what to do with it. I don't. I trust you with it. You will make it what it is supposed to be. And Kierkegaard doesn't always have that warm personal language. But he also means by that leap a very real relational leap of personal trust. First, I would like to look at that leap in Kierkegaard's work, Fear and Trembling, and then we'll return to that leap as we see it in Lilith. In Fear and Trembling, Kierkegaard analyzes this leap of faith in the context of the biblical story of Abraham's sacrifice of his son, Isaac. And Kierkegaard gives a wonderful, complex, nuanced treatment of the story, as Kierkegaard tends to do in the quality of his exposition. Kierkegaard calls this leap the leap into infinity. Kierkegaard thinks of the spiritual side of ourself as its infinite aspect. And this leap into eternity, excuse me, leap into infinity for Kierkegaard is an utter absolute renunciation. Similar to this complete giving up of Isaac, his only son, his only heir that Abraham had to make in the story. 
And this is very fresh and very personal for Kierkegaard in that it's written after his breaking off his engagement with a woman he loved and planned to marry. And whatever we think of that decision and Kierkegaard's somewhat tortured and odd reasons for it, I don't think we have to agree necessarily with Kierkegaard that he was better off alone. Yet, I think we have to recognize that we have benefited from the works of his tortured solitude and his deep thought and analysis of his condition. And in some ways, you could regard this as a somewhat self-justifying work, but it is far beyond that. Kierkegaard is able to be self-critical and to see the limitations of his renunciation. In particular, Kierkegaard understands clearly that renunciation is not an end in itself. Kierkegaard calls those people who have made this infinite, unconditional renunciation the knights of infinite resignation, knights in the sense of noble warriors. And yet, Kierkegaard sees that this in itself is not enough. The leap has to be made. But beyond the leap, there has to be a landing, a coming down back into the body, into the concrete realm of particularity, and a receiving back of our lives this time directly from God. No longer is our life something that is something for us to grasp and hold and scratch and claw for, but it's something that we receive by grace and now truly possess ourselves and the physical outer world of the senses in the way that we were always meant to possess it as the children and heirs of God. And I'm also borrowing here some from McDonald's language. In a very beautiful image, Kierkegaard compares the leap and landing to the dual motion of a professional dancer doing a grand jeté, a great leap. And there's the flying through the air, but then there's the sticking the landing. And both are motions of grace. And here's where Kierkegaard is able to be self-critical. He says, I'm able to make the leap. I'm able to do the renunciation, but I don't have the emotional strength to stick the landing, to receive it back from God, to still be able to enjoy the world, to not be jaded and emotionally spent by that effort of renunciation, but still be able to heartily enjoy the gift of the world given back to me by God. And Kierkegaard calls the people that can, that can go all the way to that second motion, second part of the motion. He calls them the knights of faith. And he says, this is where I fail. I'm, I'm a knight of infinite resignation, but I, I don't have the wherewithal to be a true knight of faith. I wish I did, and I admire those, but I think those knights of faith are very rare. But this is what, what I admire and hold up as, as the real ideal of the Christian life. That ability both to give up and to receive back. The renunciation is not an end in itself. But is this kind of renunciation then, is this, is this a kind of formality? Um, a, a kind of ceremony that, that God makes us go through to test our fidelity, to test our sincerity? And I think both Kierkegaard and MacDonald would answer no. It's a real necessity of our being, a response to the reality of things. MacDonald in particular 
stresses that in God there can be no legal fiction, nothing arbitrary, that everything that God wills is of the necessity of being. And if we could only see the reason behind it, we would see that it could be no other way, that it lies in the necessity of being. And so God is not just asking us to give everything up, to give it back to us, just to, to test us, to make us go through a formality. But there's something very deep and necessary here about the only way in which we can truly possess and enjoy ourselves and the world. In McDonald, we see this leap very clearly as required of McDonald's protagonist in the story in Lilith, Mr. Vane. And the leap that is required of Mr. Vane is this going to sleep, this embracing of the sleep that he is offered by Adam and Eve, Mr. and Mrs. Raven, several times in the story. And Mr. Vane spends most of the story trying to evade this leap, trying to get out of it. At first, when he's invited into Adam and Eve's house, he's asked to embrace their hospitality by going to sleep in this great chamber on a stone couch in this place where there's an uncounted number of other sleepers. This is a place of great cold and renunciation and negation. And he knows that this is not an ordinary sleep, that these sleepers are, are the dead and they're watched over in this vast cemetery by Mr. Raven, who is God's sexton. And their bodies are preserved by the, the great purity of the air of the place. And, and they lie there as in a sleep, but deeper than sleep waiting for the resurrection. And Mr. Vane is understandably very spooked by this whole idea and not ready to die um, and lie down in this place with the other sleepers. And he runs away. And this is the evasion of cowardice. And he is held accountable and reproached for this cowardice. And later on, at his next opportunity, we see the evasion of defiance, where he rides off to be the hero. And of course, that ends in disaster. But then finally, he gets another chance and finally embraces the sleep and goes through the purgative process through the experiences and the dreams that he experiences in that sleep. And finally, he tastes the, the joy and the glory of resurrection and is reunited with his true love. And then he's sent back into his own world to live out the rest of his life. And this whole story is a, an echo of the Divine Comedy and of Dante's pilgrim's tour through hell and purgatory, finally through paradise. And then at the summit of the experience, he's sent back into his own world to live out a wiser and truer life. And McDonald's scholars are very well aware of this, this influence of Dante is something that McDonald's very forthright about and is well known. But the embracing of this sleep is a leap into it. It's, it's that leap into infinity. And it's this leap that Mr. Vane finds it very hard to take because it has to be unreserved. He has to embrace the sleep heartily, without reservation. He's not allowed to have any control 
over when he wakes. He's given no guarantees of when he'll wake. Um, Mr. Raven says in, in this house, no one wakes of himself. And it's just like, you know, someone standing on a cliff and, and getting vertigo. He shrinks from that leap into infinity. It may seem that sleep is a very passive metaphor for the healing of self. And yet it has to be embraced very actively in the story. And it is, it is in a sense, a limited and limiting metaphor. There are other metaphors which are needed to, to fill it and round it out. But even though MacDonald and Kierkegaard are both saying that human being has to have a self and we're not trying to get rid of self, but ground ourselves in its maker in our, in our selves maker. There is a trueness to the idea of renunciation and abnegation necessarily involved. And there is a place for that. And they're both examining that. And the best Christian mystics also describe this in terms of a sleep from self. It is in a very real sense, the giving up of the direction of our self-consciousness, right? Sleep is a giving up of our self-consciousness and it putting ourselves in a helpless position where our self-consciousness is mediated from beyond ourselves. And we have very little or no control over it. And it's a reflection of that putting our being in the hands of the Father and allowing ourselves to be conscious of ourselves only through God, through the knowledge that He radiates into our own being. And therefore, there is then an embracing of every experience that he sends to us moment by moment, very much as what we have to do in our dreams. And through those God-sent experiences, we are purified and made whole. So there is a place for the image of death in regard to our selfhood as one half of that motion of grounding. And George MacDonald expresses this very beautifully in one of his diary poems that sums up a lot of what he says in his sermons and in all his writings. And here it is. But love is life. To die of love is then the only pass to higher life than this. All love is death to loving living men. All deaths are leaps across clefts to the abyss. Our life is the broken current, Lord of thine, flashing from morn till morn with conscious shine. Then first by willing death self-made, then life divine. And this encapsulates a lot of McDonald's theology. So this death is love. It is the death of love, of self-gift, and that is a self-abandonment. All love is death to loving living men. All deaths are leaps across clefts to the abyss. There is that leap into infinity that Kierkegaard is talking about. In the last lecture, we talked about McDonald's understanding of self as precious because it's, it's what we have to offer and it gives us our most precious possession. 
what we have to offer. And this self-gift is a death, necessarily speaking, and an entrance into relationship where we know ourselves only through the other. And for McDonald, what we're doing here is we are joining Christ. We are taking our part in our own creation. We are taking up our role as sons of God. And this is returning to McDonald's great sermon, The Creation in Christ, and other sermons like it. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, deaths himself into the Father by willing to be this subordinate being who lives and is because of the Father. And in doing so, takes up the full dignity of his position and the life of sonship. And this is the greatest gift that we could be given is to be allowed to join Jesus in this, to be priests offering ourselves as Abraham in the story is really offering himself, his own life his own possibility of continuance, his own potential. And that offering, of course, is secure. The gifts of God are irrevocable. You know, MacDonald in another diary poem says, but all things are ours. All things shall be ours. All things were made for us. We are God's heirs. We take up that position only in that, that leap of naked absolute trust where our whole beings are consciously in the Father's hands, knowing that he is actively making and shaping us right now and always and that he will satisfy us with being. Thank you so much, and I look forward to talking with you again.